Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. This episode of the House of Mystery is brought to you by Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. LegacyFoodStorage.com Fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Third on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Well, it's a mystery. I'm your host today, Al Warren, and joining me on the co-host seat is Mr. David North Martino. Hey, Al. Hey. Good to be here. Yeah, always, <laughs> always, always. I still, still sound like a serial killer with three names. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Yeah, no, no. That's right. We won't talk about what's in the basement. No. Uh, no. Well, now today, uh, going from... Singers to all of a sudden today, we've got two authors. Um, looks like a father son team, and we're going to be talking about uh, their book Spellbound Under the Spanish Moss A Southern Tale of Magic. So, welcome to the show, Connor Garrett and Kevin Garrett. Thanks for being here. Thank you for hey. having us. Uh, uh, Sal and David, thank you so much, guys. Wow. So, now, a uh, father son team. Um, how, how did that? happen i have to ask um i couldn't imagine writing anything with my father um so how did how did you guys get connected enough and about a certain subject where you wanted to write something well i I met him a little while ago when he made me um so that was cool it was a nice intro (laughs) and uh (laughs) and you know how we kind of got started with it was um we had always talked we've Obviously, we're close, um, but, you know, ever since I was a little kid, right, my dad's a photographer by trade and a writer as well, but we had always, he'd been showing me around and just always trying to teach me things about art and life, and, uh, you know, I, my passion really developed for writing, though, as I got older, and, um, I mean, really just developed all the way to the point that it became an absolute obsession, and, we just kind of decided we wanted to collaborate and it had been something we discussed a few times. Um, just every now and then we'd think this would be interesting. Um, but something particular stood out, which was big fish. And I think it sort of planted a nice seed where, you know, I think it's, it's uh, important to note where your inspiration comes from. I think to always give credit where credit's due. And we really love the whimsy of big fish. And I think that that was kind of a, a big seed, but uh, Roger, you could kind of elaborate from there and talk about the 
the next steps? Sure. Um, I think that, you know, as Connor mentioned, we were always interested in, you know, and dreamed of when we get, when, when we get older, me getting very old and then him getting old enough to, you know, really be able to plant and have some life experience. We wanted to make some art together. We wanted to write something together. We wanted to write songs. You know, we'll, we'll first have to learn to play music first, but I mean, you know, anyway, but we had big dreams and aspirations <laughs> from it. We want to make something together. And, uh, you know, as Connor was packing up to, moved to Lebanon, you know, we kind of made a promise to use what's happened to talk and confer every day. Just let's just keep our friendship and let's just stay close no matter what. And, you know, he had this big, long list of ideas. He goes, I've got, you know, I don't know, 10 or 15 ideas of possible book subjects I'd like to um, follow through with. And he goes, this is, if you were going to order them, what would you order them? And if you were interested in any of them, what would you interest? And he had a Southern theme, um, you know, novel that he had started when he was younger. And, you know, interestingly, I had one from about 20 years ago that I stopped on. And, you know, just, you know, Connor can speak for himself about why I stopped. But I just, you know, as I was writing, I was editing, and I was just, you know, I just have, have a big, had and have a big critic living inside of me. And so, anyway, we chose a, a Southern novel, and he started to work on it when he got to Lebanon and we started to confer on it every single morning at eight o'clock Georgia time. You know, we had a writing session and we just both felt compelled to have something to show the other one each day. And we worked off a shared Google doc and, you know, I don't know, what was it, Connor, about four months and we had a, we had a finished book. Well, there was, so the outlining took a few months, but you know, once we got writing, it actually took us three weeks to write the book because the outlines had been so thorough that it was 21 days of pure writing. Mm. Um, there was really the process was very smooth. Uh, it was just the three quarter mark of the book was difficult where there's a point where outlines can only get you so far. You can outline as much as you want, but there's a certain point where, um, you know, your, your story is going to kind of surprise you a little bit and that happened about three quarters of the way through but we actually ended up getting over it and then the story became stronger um after that point so you know and because of that so that that little tension there three quarters of the way through was very valuable for the book i i see now uh kind of the subject here when you talk about it um a southern tale of magic so what is it you mean by that, like uh, the magic theme? Like how, how is that into, incorporated in the story? Well, the, so the story, um, being a fantasy book, it's very whimsical by nature. So as you go through, you'll meet all kinds of uh, very interesting characters. Some are literally magic and some are uh, character-wise kind of magical. Wally, for example. Wally, there's a magic in his being, in his essence, right? He may not be a, <laughs> he's kind of a, a messed up messiah of sorts to the story, right? And there's, so there's, there's a lot of things like that going on in the setting itself. There's some interesting things going on, but um, one of the, the large kind of crux of the story here is that Gareth Grayfriend's father, Samuel, actually gets bitten by a, a snake as they're careening the boat. And so then that leaves them kind of on a quest uh, for the ingredients to get him basically out of this suspended animation that he gets put in by a witch. And so, but the story is really about the characters that you meet along the way. You know, that's, I think, what makes it an interesting story is the characters. How do you manage the storylines and uh, character arcs in, in the novel um, between, between um, both of you as you're as you're working through uh, uh, the story and, and the, uh, the plot? I think a large part of that is a respect for each other's talents. Um, I came into it admiring my dad's thought patterns because we think differently. Um, I've worked really hard at developing my skills as a, I feel like this may sound a bit grandiose, I don't mean it to, but as a poet, what I'm, and I don't mean poet as an I am so poetic, but I mean that just literally writing poetry. So one word to the next, trying to compound power um, and trying to put the words together in the right order and being very uh, meticulous with that. And then I think I had a great respect for his ability to think through 
plot and structure and sort of, uh, neither of us are particularly organized, but to think organized when it comes to character and to think organized when it comes to plot. And so I think a large part of it just comes to a respect for each other's talents, you know, and uh, not, hey, I respect you because you're my dad. No, like, he's good. He's good at what he does. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that because I'm his son. I'm saying that because it's true. So <laughs> You can tell us the truth later. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's, it's interesting, but um, I, I think it's an interesting dynamic to have a father and son write something together, especially a fiction story. Uh, because in the creation of characters, usually with fiction writers, they either hear voices in their head or they have some sort of a way of, of getting these characters, of, of creating them, discovering them. Quite, they can be quite different. And you're from different generations as well, so uh, it's just it's just interesting to see that. So for each of you, let's start uh, like Kevin. Who, how is it that your characters that you create or develop, even characters that Connor did, um, where does that come from for you? Where does that come from for me? Um, that's a that's a great question. I I think that one of the one of the ways that we came together. Early in the book, there's some tension early in the book between the father and son. And, you know, friends of ours who read the book ask, oh, was the tension in the early part of the book, was that you and Connor when he was a young teenager? And I go, actually, no, it wasn't. Connor and I have always been very close. You know, we have a, you know, the natural bumps, you know, that you have from a child as they start to assert themselves and, you know, become his own man. You know, I'm, I'm more of a an advisor. I'm not a boss, and I'm not the dad, and you know, I'm not the guru. You know, you you become very fallible to your children as you as you age. But um, we were working through like how to how to you know how do we write the tension between Gareth and his father Samuel when they're on the on the boat and Connor. Uh, I actually wrote the, the, the part of Gareth being the rebellious teenager I wrote because that was based on me and my father. You know, I had that dialogue inside. I go, but I'm not sure how the father should be. And Connor, Connor wrote the father. He wrote the father's character. And then for the rest of it, you know, the book is magical realism. You know, so what we wanted to do with our characters was, well, what, where do they need to go next why would they do that? Even if we don't write it, you know, we had a we had an inner dialogue and a backstory for each of the characters, and we tried to move them along so that you would feel growth and change, and uh, the re the relationships grow and change as we move the the book along. But it needed to be based on okay, well, if that's what you want it to do, you know, if he's going to be down in the in the, you know, there's a there's a place where we're in the cenote, and. Uh, you know, how, do, how does he get there? Why do they get there? How do they get out of there? And how does that move the story along? When it came to the character development, again, um, we always try to write with dimensionality in mind. So I think a lot of times people end up, um, I shouldn't say a lot of times, sometimes people can fall into the trap of writing caricatures instead of characters. Mm. And the difference, the difference between those would be caricatures are idealized so they're all good and they're all bad and in our case our characters are mostly complex in their motivations um they're complex in their behaviors uh you know they're they can be good with tinges of bad or moments of bad make mistakes like real people do and i think a lot of times People want to telegraph whether the characters are good or bad to the audience. And I think that's when they become caricatures. And so that was really important to us. And part of the way we did that was by drawing upon people that we actually know and love. Because, um, you know, we talk about this all the time, too, as well. It's like not only – so it's really interesting with, with people. And this is the same with characters in a book. They're changing as the story goes along, just like you're changing throughout your life, you're evolving throughout your life. But then to add a whole other layer of dimensionality to it, everyone experiences another human being slash character in a different way. So it's the same way everyone may not like this guy, right? Maybe, they're, maybe they actually behave differently depending on who they're around. And then from there, you can also look at, well, in addition to what are they saying, it's what are they not saying? 
What information are they withholding from this character? And then it, it begs the question, why are they withholding that information from that character? So it's just interesting playing around with these different dynamics that can add dimensionality to your characters. So that was, that was another um, aspect of it. So you're taking people you know. Okay, so give us the dirt. Who, who, <laughs> <laughs> who, are, who have you used as a – no, when you that's, – that's interesting, but when you take uh, – when you say it's from people you know and love, so it's, it's, it's someone in your life – you've kind of taken part of their character, not all of it, and you've sort of made it into something. Um, do, do you do that by putting yourself into that character as You can well? mix it all together. Um, you know, f f for example, and this is also another thing too, even with character motivations is, for example, um, so one of the characters was, was uh, my uncle Kevin was in part of him, and then I can explain further on that. Um, but, and, and then with the banjo player, there were some things that were Wally. There were some things that were aspirational that I kind of put my dad and I almost together in him as well. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that was really important, but yeah, you know, it's like a lot of times when people do something, they're not always making the decision that it might appear that they're making when they do a certain action. For example, Someone could have sorts of uh, unconscious trauma or unconscious baggage that caused them to do something that's seemingly malicious, but it's their unconscious trauma that could cause that, that exact action. So at that point, is it that it's a malicious action? Not necessarily. Now, the result may be the same, so perhaps you need to distance yourself just as far from that character, but... That's that's where these things become even more complex. So we were looking at things like that with our characters. It's like how can you look at a character with complete objective with a complete objective lens? Um, you know, if if you're basing it off of things you've experienced for better or for worse, and how they made you feel and all this, looking at it from an objective lens, you know, looking at what are, what are these characters' intentions. What are the results? And then how does another character need to respond to that character based on their own past traumas, their own difficulties? But to, to kind of the main question that you asked there, you know, my Uncle Kevin was one of the characters we thought about when it came to Wally, -E, um, you know, because he's got a lot of very lovable qualities. And then, you know, just like my dad and I, he's got some other kind of fun, quirky qualities as well. So you mix it all together there and you get, a you know, an interesting – character and then you know for Freya which was the mom you know my own mom was a part of that um for the dad my own dad was a part of that um trying to think who else you know I would say there's a sacrificial nature to Wally that was kind of a part uh Richard Becker who was a principal of mine um trying to think who else who else Padre who else did we kind of mix in there well, you know, as we as we wrote the Freya character, you know, I told you the story of my dad's mother. My uh, I never met my grandmother. You know, she died when my father was away at college. I think he was 18 years old at the time. So, you know, I never I never met her. And the only way she lives is through the stories that my father would tell me about her. And um, Gareth doesn't know his mother. She died as he was. He was born when he was a baby, so he doesn't know his mom. The only way he knows his mom is through the stories of his father. So we used, we used, you know, what happened with my father as I, I feel like I know and I love my grandmother, though I never met her. Uh, you know, one thing I have to say is when you um, write a fictional character and, and how you've mixed and matched and you put yourself into all these characters, um, in a way you're kind of... Um, exposing some of your own feelings and and you make yourself a little bit vulnerable to the reader um so is it really important um how how, how people react to your writing then i think definitely i think that a lot of um writers especially younger writers i've heard it a lot where for some reason and i think it's a little bit of a defense mechanism they'll a lot of times say well i write for me you know, it's like, that's cute and all, but, um, you know, fiction and writing is a half-formed world, right? So no matter what, 
you know, you have your half as the writer that you formed, and then there's the projection of whatever your reader is envisioning kind of forms the rest of that landscape in their minds. So you depend on the reader in a lot of ways, and you have to respect that. And, you know, so I think it's a bit, like, arrogant to say that you just write for yourself and that sort of thing. So When you write these characters, yeah. you know, you put yourself into it. So you're putting some of your own feelings down on paper. You're kind of exposing or making yourself vulnerable to the reader in a sense. You know, so I could be reading the story, and I know some of you is in that character, and some of what you're say, saying or feeling through that character is, is kind of it. It, it makes you vulnerable a little bit, and so I was just wondering about, so if someone reads it and kind of goes, well, that's a lousy character, or they, you know what I'm saying, so you, you kind of get feedback from people, good and bad, um, towards your own feelings in characters that you've created, and I'm just wondering if... Uh, I see what you're saying, yeah, so the judgments towards the characters, that's a, that's a funny thing, so there's vice signaling and there's virtue signaling, and they're both sort of interesting concepts. And I think, you know, it's, it's one of those things where if you're truthful and you're raw, like I think we do some, ver some vice signaling in the story as well in, in sort of subtle ways. And it's like I think, you know, both my dad and I are pretty, pretty frank about who we are and what we believe for better and for worse, you know. And so, I mean, we've had some viewpoints that both of us, I know, have shifted over time that, haven't necessarily always been on the straight and narrow, but we've always tried to do net positive in the world. And so it's kind of like, I feel like we're at peace with ourselves. So any sort of judgment that, that readers may have about certain characters, um, I, don't, I don't feel like it, I don't feel particularly vulnerable about any of them, if that makes sense personally. I don't know how you feel, Padre, but that's that's my view on it. Oh, I, I, that's good. Well said, Connor. I feel... Uh... I don't feel vulnerable, you know, if I get a critique on it or if somebody has something to say about some of the characters. I like this character. I don't like that character. If they like the character, I don't feel, you know, oh, you're really praising me. You know, I don't feel that at all. I think, but I do think that as we write this, you know, the more you can be real, you know, a realness to people and you're vulnerable with your characters, you know, their, their, their flaws and their good attributes, you know, the more you connect with the reader. You know, it's just like all of our stories, you know. It's like if you're trying to always paint yourself as a hero, you know, and I'm only going to tell good sides of every story, you know. It's like you really don't you really don't connect with friends. You don't connect with family. You don't connect with people, you know, the way you do when you just paint yourself as you really are. We're all fallible. Yeah, yeah, everyone but me. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> and, and now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this. So you've got the, the you know, the top story that, you know, He's bitten, and um, there's the search for the cure. But under that story, under the the, 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 the main storyline, do you have a um, let's say an, an under under a theme or something that? Um, so I pick up your book, I read it. Um, what is it you want me to take away from that, other than the story? That's a better way to say it. Yeah. One of the things would be how the characters transform each other. I think that's a very critical part of it. You know, just seeing how belief can transform people, um, kindness can transform. Um, con conversely, I mean, you know, I think, well, I guess our characters, this, the, at the point where we're on page in the story, it's mostly based on most of the characters are actually seeing positive change that they, um, are affecting upon each other less than negative. So some negative things have happened to all the characters maybe off page, but as far as really when our action is taking place, I think they're all affecting each other pretty positively. Um, I, I would also say uh, the capacity for someone to be a hero in a moment, to choose to be hero, to choose to be good, as opposed to necessarily being inherently good or inherently amazing because you know growing up like you know in a fairly religious context um you know we're almost especially as kids right you're told for instance uh to be like jesus as an example but if you take that literally then you're looking at at least uh scripturally something that's supposed to be perfect 
right, in theory. And so you can kind of misunderstand that and then think that the standard is to be perfect. And I think that that was a really important message in our story was that it's not really the case. The goal is not perfection. The goal is striving. The goal is uh, hopefully just to try to do better the next day than you did the day before. And, um, yeah, just just, just not perfect. <laughs> that's, that's, I think that's an enormous part of it because – uh, even our, even one of our main main characters, there's something that, um, on a very physical level, is kind of considered. I guess would you say it's a flaw? It may not be PC to say, but um, definitely slows her down. And you know she's able to kind of work around that, and actually ends up in a pretty spreading her wings in a pretty glorious way. So, I'm wondering when you um, when you're when you're running dialogue. I'm wondering, do you hear the characters in your head? Do um, and, and and how how do you together as, as you know, since both of you are writing the book, um, do you ever find that there's there's a conflict maybe in how the characters sound, or are you able to pretty much mesh uh, those characters between yourselves? Um, you know, we had a we had a rule as we started to write a rule or an agreement between the two of us. The best idea wins. Yeah. The only thing that matters is what propels mm -hmm. the book forward. Just park your ego at the door. And if you come up with it, bravo. If I come up with it, bravo. Either way, both of our names are on it, you know. And there's, there are days where, you know, um, you know, it may be 70, 70, 30, and then another day, you know, 10, 90, you know, in terms of, of how much each of us put into it. But, you know, in the end of it, you know, the book is Garrett and Garrett, and uh, and that enables us to go ahead and, um, you know, be so excited by the time we got to the end of this book that we started outlining on book two. And uh, we're at, currently at work doing uh, revisions on book two in this series now. We interrupt our programming. This is a national emergency. Important details will follow. Are you prepared? Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. Go now to LegacyFoodStorage.com. Use coupon code HOM15 now for 15% off. Quick, go. The following is an important time insensitive announcement from Staples. Now for an unlimited time only, Staples is drastically cutting their everyday prices on hundreds of products your business needs. That's right. The clock is not ticking. Walk, crawl, or lollygag to Staples, and you will not miss this opportunity. These are everyday price cuts. Take a four-pack of AA Duracell batteries, was four seventy nine, now just two ninety nine. But act now or later because these Staples everyday price cuts will be around for a really, really long time. Price cuts like a two-pack of Scotch Magic Tape, previously $4.79, now just $2.99. And Scotch Packaging Tape, now just $2.29 for today, tomorrow, and pretty much every day till the cows come home. But don't hurry. These everyday price cuts are indefinite. To repeat, these prices will last. So stop by your nearest Staples whenever it's convenient and take advantage of these normal, continuing everyday price cuts. Thank you. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. P -p 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 powder donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name your price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous walrus, the bulbous walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. You're listening to the House of Mystery radio show. History, crime, conspiracy.
inspiration from, uh, let's say, Connor, um, as in, uh, is it other writers? Is it music? Is it people? Um, where do you, where do you kind of get your spark? Yeah, so that's a I love that question. That's a great question. Um, I think it's a whole variety of sources. I think I try to take a little bit of everything that I can. Um, I give a lot of credit to when it comes to putting work, just simply putting words together. I give a lot of credit to um, a lot of the surrealist poets like Pablo Neruda, um, Octavio Paz, uh, Federico Lorca, um, where are some others, but those would be the big ones there. In terms of just thinking, maybe thinking creatively about story, I think Kurt Vonnegut's really interesting. I haven't read as much of him as I'd like, um, but I think he's really interesting in terms of just not feeling stuck to genre. Like I, I think Slaughterhouse Five is still like the most genius book ever. <laughs> um, yeah. I think a lot of the songwriters really impressed me, like Don Henley. I think he's really interesting, um, and just just yeah, I think just seeing their work ethic because imagining how they got through a lot of their insecurities because they're, they're not just hearing things, um, they're not just looking at things from a story perspective. They're looking at things also having to hear them and just, just bring so many elements together. And I could see how, if you're a perfectionist, how they would probably, I mean, just to get all the elements to come together perfectly would just be a really difficult challenge. And then I also get inspired by artists that I kind of view as great, but very flawed. I think they're the most inspiring. So for example, in prose, Jack Kerouac, um, I look at him as a, a great writer for sure. But I don't think that he's untouchable as an example. Like, I think that you can read him and you can kind of pick up on what he's doing. And if, if it was your desire to write your version of On the Road, you may not have the same commercial success as he had because some of that's a matter of timing and a bunch of things. But I think that he has an emul you know, a, a style that can be emulated. Um, when it comes to music, you know, for instance, you hear like Jim Morrison as an example for The Doors. Was he the most fantastic singer um, maybe not, but he absolutely had a style and he was, had a great fit with his band. And so, you know, I think those are, those are kind of interesting because they take out some of the pressure of it because if you want to be great, you feel naturally a lot of pressure as you're working. So I think those guys that are, uh, great, but, but kind of, you feel like maybe the time aided some of their success. I think those are also really inspirational too, because they sort of, I don't want to say they lower the bar, but they just, they take out some of the air in a good way. So I'd say, you know, the doors uh, is big. So it, it's just, it's just from all over the place. And then besides that, I think, um, you know, not to be corny, but obviously, you know, my, uh, my, my, my co-author here, I think has been a big inspiration as well. Uh, just through the years, just having a lot of talks about creative process and, you know, then us finding our own creative processes separately. He's still evolving and working on his, you know. Um, so that's my my long rant. So I'll pass it to him so he can do his thing. Um, I, uh, I I heard of a program, I don't know, a year, year or two ago. It was Don Henley and Glenn Fry talking about how they learned to write songs. And they talked about, hey, we were in an apartment, and down below us, we would get woken up in the morning by the banging of the piano, and they lived above Jackson Brown. And they said, listening to him work taught us how to write, but listening to him work from early in the morning to late at night taught us to work hard. And that stuck with me, too, is that it doesn't mean that just because somebody can play music or somebody can write a song or somebody can write a novel doesn't mean that it was easy for them. It's that they were curious and they were persistent and they were driven and they were willing to look bad and to, to struggle through things. And um, I was really inspired by that, and I'm always moved by what allows somebody to get in and be creative and to do it for a very long time, like the Rolling Stones or like you two. But, uh, you know, as Connor was talking, I made note of a couple of my favorite, favorite songwriters. And Don Henley was on my list, you know, 
also with Radney Foster from Texas and Rodney Crowell up in Nashville and Carol King. You know, it's just, um, you know, her, her tapestry album that she wrote when she moved out to California, you know, just in- inspires me still after all, all this time. Um, you know, when I think of a writer like Louis L'Amour, you know, who was, you know, what wrote in the Western genre, but during his lifetime, he wrote 88 novels. And, you know, if I reach the end of my days, I, I really, uh, I, you know, I work as a commercial photographer. I, I shoot advertising and tourism and lifestyle sector. I also shoot fine art, but, I, you know, I hate to be a, a bit macabre like this, but, you know, Richard Avedon died as he was shooting a job, and I hope that I'm writing something or shooting when the end of my time comes. Yeah, well, that's probably the best way to go, isn't it? Doing something you love, <laughs> you know, that's what they say. But uh, um, how do you think this has changed you? Like doing this novel with your father, Connor, and you come out of it at the end and you look back at it now, uh, have you noticed any um, changes in your own your own self, your own behavior? I think, yeah, I would say definitely. Um, I think more external changes and internal I think, I think a lot of times in life, it's like you can look at a lot of things and it's, it's, did you really change so much or did you, did the circumstances around you change? I think it's important to know when those things are, are different. And in my case, I think the first book that I wrote that was a full length book was called Falling Up in the City of Angels. And it's, it was inspired a lot by On the Road. And uh, it was about, you know, the guy kind of turned it into fiction, but it was honestly all true stuff, but it was about, you know, a young writer who who leaves uh, his hometown and goes out to Los Angeles and kind of (laughs) is a bit of a lost boy wandering around out there and finding his way. And it's, it's a book about lostness actually and about longing and a whole bunch of things, but it's a, it's a fun book, but um, that book then, you know, gave me sort of a, not a confidence, but it was like, okay, check, right? Gave me something to step on, right? I think each project's like a step, helps you step up another step. And I think that it gave me the peace to be able to work with my dad on this book, you know, because I think had I not seen that I could do it, I think I would have, maybe my pride would have gotten in the way, you know, whereas because I've written a book, there was no sense of pride with this in, in, in any kind of negative way. I was concerned about that when you first started because, you know, you work so hard on a book and, you know, you want to feel a sense of ownership when it's done. And the idea of writing fiction with someone else, I, I was concerned a little bit at first that it would feel, I wouldn't feel the same sense of pride or skill or like I'd, like I'd earned the story, you know, but it wasn't that way at all. We worked hard together and, it was never a sense of diminishing for either of us. I never felt like, oh, you know, couldn't have done this, didn't do it. It's like, nah, we just we just worked on creating the best story we could. So I'd say as far as changes really, just just being grateful and feeling really happy and proud of what what we've done. It's given me peace to focus on other areas of my life because it was you know, not not finishing a fiction book and not finishing certain things was driving me so crazy that it, it was making it hard to hold down jobs. It was making it hard to sleep. It was making it hard to do anything because I wanted it that badly. And so it, it, you know, to an extent, it was just, it was making me actually crazy, you know, literally. So uh, so I guess that's a change is that it, it, it's brought me a lot of peace. It's helped me be more sane and we're gearing up you know, for the second one, it's done pretty much, and we're just revising and the third, and just just the joys of creating, and it's yeah, it's grounded me a lot. So I'd say that's a big change. Yeah, man. Um, I just feel like for me, I, this was a labor of love, you know, a, kind of a fulfillment of a dream, you know, that I got to work on a project with my son, you know, and every day we just roll up our sleeves and go to the laboratory or go to the studio together and work to create something. And it was just, it was such a fun ride. Um, and I feel like of, of all the things I've got or all the things that I've done, you know, I've got a box to check off now. It's like, by golly, 
we wrote a novel. We wrote a fantasy novel, a historical fiction fantasy novel together. And forevermore, we've got that. And I think the other ones will be better. And But, you know, man, there's something magical and wonderful about the first. And, uh, you know, it really helped me kill the critic and speed the process. And it's actually, you know, Connor, you said something earlier about something that given you, given you wings. You know, I feel like this has given me wings to be a little less critical, a little less uncertain, you know, with, uh, with my other projects and other things that I'm working on, you know, and I'm, I'm proud and excited forevermore to have this and to be able to say that we did it together. I was wondering, do you, either of you have any hobbies or activities that inform your, your work that you draw, draw on to create story? Yeah. Walking. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, really. <laughs> walking for sure. I'd say it's funny. Most people don't call walking a hobby, but um, walking mm. is huge, you know, because it clears out your head, you know, and you see things and you feel things and it just, I don't know, it gives you time to really reflect. Um, so walking would be huge. Uh, music is definitely a big part of changing out the headspace for, for, you know, lyricism and poeticism, but walking would be huge. Uh, you know, exercise is a good break in things. And, you know, sometimes also, you know, for, for me, now this is maybe where my dad and I differ, but every now and then, you know, going out at night, you know, into whether that's, you know, it may not be what Jay Rice said, but to a club or to some kind of a social setting and just watching people and enjoying the night and, having a little bit more of a hedonistic night every now and then is a good little, uh, that can be a nice hobby too. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count the nightlife as a hobby for, uh, for him or for me. However, <laughs> would join in with the hiking and the, the walking though, is that I think, um, Connor and I are both kinetic. It's, you know, it's like when I'm, when I'm walking or when I'm moving or if I'm hiking and moving in nature, it's, uh, it's easier for me to process things, you know, like I'm, I'm, I remember things that I've shot, I've photographed and I'll be editing and rearranging things and kind of imagine how I'm going to move the sliders when I get back to the, to the office on photos that I'm doing or how do we, you know, what would move a character? What would move the story for tomorrow when we, when, when I need to be on the call on the phone with Connor. Um, so I think that it, you know, it helps relax me. To, to walk and to hike and to move. And uh, it helps me to uh, move my creative thoughts along. You know, I wonder, you know, with the, um, the last few years and, and the uh, tension felt around the U S as well as um, the pandemic and, and all the things going on. I wonder if that being that you're a fiction writer, um, would that have any influence on the writing itself, like does it seep in some way, making it dark? Like, and even not that. Just if you're in a in a stress, stressful situation in your life, or if something's going on, uh, does that get in the way of, of your writing process? I'll start with Connor. Yeah. So it's funny when I first came to Lebanon. Um, I don't know. It was it maybe that 2019 or something like that? Um, the protests because of the economic situation here and all kinds of things, they started the week after I landed. <laughs> or maybe it was, it, might have been it was maybe like four days after I landed. And so there was like burning tires everywhere. And, and if you know Lebanon, there's kind of one main road. Like there's, you have some roads in the mountains, but you really have one main road to get from anywhere in the country pretty much. So if there's burning tires on that road and there's protests, then you can't really go anywhere. Everything's sort of shut down. It's it's odd. It's very it's like it's very easy if you wanted to. It's a very easy country to shut down if you wanted to completely just cripple it. I guess it's they've done it themselves at this point. But so anyways, um, you know what that did though is it meant that all through the writing process in this first time over, you know, a lot of times I mean we literally shut shut in the house in a way where you can go anywhere. And at the same time, my uh, fiance both, so her dad had died in that same year, earlier in the year, then her mom ended up dying later in the same year, both of cancer. But at the time I was also helping her take care of her mom as we were writing. 
So there was a lot of death and grief around, and that that also definitely is a theme in the book for sure. Um, so it was absolutely informed by that and watching her and how she was navigating grief and uh, navigating death and these things, that's topics that do come up in this story for sure. Um, and I think in addition to that, you know, even now as we've been working um, on some other things in the second book, the, the lockdowns, just like everybody's been affected by them, you know, when they were partial lockdowns, that was fine. But over here, I don't know, you know, what you guys experienced, but there were times where we had complete lockdowns, to like, I mean, 100% total lockdowns, which meant that the only thing you could do is you could have groceries delivered to your house, but you couldn't leave a house. So there was a point where we were essentially staying in one room for like two months at a time over here and uh, four, four people in one room for two months. And so it was weird because it was like a very luxurious prison is what I find. And what I mean by that, and that's, but it's good to experience that because I've never taken freedom for granted. Um, but it helped me navigate how you, how do you deal with a mental prison? How do you deal with, because ultimately if you're feeling some sort of physical imprisonment, that's the first place you're feeling it, but where it manifests itself is in your mind. And so it was working on how do we write when you're completely feel completely <laughs> trapped, completely. So you feel like all your JK Rowling talks about the dementors, right? They were a metaphor for her depression. But so when you basically have the dementors sucking everything out of you all over yourself, how do you fight through that? And how do you create and why do you like, if you, when you lose your why, when you don't have a, a reason how do you reverse engineer that and find a reason to create in spite of your why being completely drained away from you and eliminated, butchered, everything you can imagine? How do you keep creating? You know, so that, that so yeah, to your, I love that. By the way, these are really great questions. So thank you guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, so absolutely what you asked, these have had an enormous impact on our writing and as our growth as authors. And Padre, over to you. <laughs> Yeah, I think the the pandemic gives us all a sense that we're we're on an island. You know, I, that's that's what it felt like. You know, the road the roads are empty. It's just like everybody everybody's gone and everybody's afraid. And you know, I felt very alone during that time. And um, you know, I think that there was a, a a sense of that in the early part of the book. You know, when the father is you know when Samuel is struck by the rattlesnake, you know, there's no place to go. You know, it's like, uh, I'm, I'm going to die. There's only one thing that we can do. If, if you can get me to the witch, then I've got one chance for it. You know, it's just like, you know, for us with the pandemic, you know, we're just holding on, you know, and we all know people that have gotten sick and we know people that have, that have passed. I had a very close friend of mine lose four family members within seven days. Um, you know, it was, um, you know, it, it, it's touched us all. So, uh, yeah, I do believe that it worked its way into our, into our writing there. It's an interesting time and it's just, um, um, but writing a fantasy, I'd imagine <laughs> that, um, part of it and part of the magic is to, um, perhaps bring people out of, a, a negative thought, you know what I mean? But be, be a little bit more fantasy to, to get away from things. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of times I think what happens as well, though, is that fantasy um, can be written purely for children. And what I mean by that is it's like we talked about, you know, dimensionality, you know, and I think a lot of times it's simplified so much or it's tried to be made to be so clear. Everything is. And I think some of these challenges that added maybe a bit of shadow to things um, are good because, you know, it's like, how, again, how do you remain hopeful even when things do look a bit dark, you know, um, that, that's a very important part of all of this. Well, you know, so now how do people find, find you or get a hold of, do you guys have a website together or do you have some sort of, you know, um, Facebook together or anything like that? Or what, how do you, what do you, what do you got set up for people? Well, my dad's got a great photography website 
I get stuck with that because he's uh, – no, I'm seriously, you know, he shoots all over the world for it. So that's – is that GarrettPhoto.com? What is that? Garrett.com. Yeah, so that's that's a good one. I'm, I mean, I'm not biased, I swear. It's really just that good. Um, and then, you know, we have a publishing company as well that uh, my mom and I run together, who is uh, basically Freya in the book. <laughs> so that's lucidhousepublishing.com, L-U-C-I-D-H-O-U-S-E-P-U-B-L-I-S-H-I-N-G.com. Um my Instagram is at ConnorJudsonGarrett.com. Uh, same with my, I think that's my author page on Facebook as well. That's that's most of the stuff I can think about right now. Mm, oh, that's fine. We'll get that up on our website too so people listening can do one click and they can find you, you know, send you their their thoughts and, and, and mail and stuff like that. And, uh, wow, it's pretty interesting. So, um Good luck. So you're going on to our second book next, eh? Hey? And uh, is it going to be? Is this going to be kind of a series, or is this all new characters? It's actually a series, and we've taken our characters from the first book, and the the ending of the book, ending of the first book, leads you right to the beginning of the the second book. And the first book is set in uh, coastal Georgia, you know, outside of Savannah in the 1920s, and then the Next book is uh, the title, the working title on the book is Fragrance of a Shadow, and it's set in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, in the area around San Juan. Uh, he's not going to get bit um, by a snake again, is he? Nah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to pick the book up. Come on, see. some you spoilers here. And see. We got some, we got got some, some spoilers coming. here. Come on. we got to know. You know, uh, it's, it's it's crazy. So that's great that you. you know, did, I, I'm interested. So either one of you, like even Connor, did, did you always think you were going to be a writer? Was that something that you you were writing from as young as you can remember, or is this something that came along late? Um, I think I'd wanted to write for a long time, but because my mom was a writer, honestly, I. Uh, and her and I are very different in a lot of ways. I think I viewed it as a, um, and this is a compliment to her, obviously, but I viewed it as an intelligent person's profession. And I didn't at a young age necessarily think that I was all that intelligent. And so because of that, I, you know, cause I, I have ADHD, I have a few things that kind of at times have made friends in school, not, not the best place for me. And um, gave me some challenges that I had to work through and learn mechanisms to get around. And so definitely didn't think I was the smartest person and thought that writing was like kind of above me. I, I, I remember from a young age, I was interested in it, but I wouldn't even attempt it because I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't a lot of times finish paragraphs or sentences because the ADHD would take me in so many different directions. Um, so but, you know, eventually it got to an age where Lord of the Rings, for instance, you know, every single time I was having a, a really hard time or was depressed or whatever was going on, I'd watch Lord of the Rings. And so I knew that's when I started to connect the dot that, okay, I really love stories and I want to create something like this. That was initially, initially the thing. And then the first time, though, that I connected with a book was uh, I decided one summer that I was going to read on my own right because I didn't really ever before this point love what they'd make me read the school or anything like that but I read uh The Great Gatsby it wasn't assigned to anything but read it and it was the first time I'd really been moved by something that was in text written form like that and that was the first point where okay I knew I liked story because of movies and then I saw okay you can use it effectively in a way that does matter and so that was the beginning of, I, I mean, it's a kind of an amateurish way to look at it, but it's like, yeah, Lord of the Rings and the Great Gatsby. Those were sort of the starts of, of my um, journey in a way. And then after that, it was just pure passion, just obsession, you know, knowing for a long time. Because, of course, when you start off, you're garbage. You're an absolutely terrible writer, pretty much no matter what. And <laughs> I was really bad, but I really knew I loved it even though I was terrible and I knew I wanted to be good, even though I was very far from that mark. 
And, you know, there's still levels that I want to get to that I'm still very far from. But it's an obsession, you know. That's the thing is it's like I think to to do it, and especially write long form, you got to be obsessed with it. If you're not, you probably shouldn't be doing it. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, good words. Well, it, it's certainly been a pleasure talking to you guys. Um, now, the book we're talking about is Spellbound Under the Spanish Moss. It's a southern tale of magic, and our guests have been the authors, Connor and Kevin Garrett. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, David. Thank you guys so much for having us. Thank you for having us. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end. By George, he's got it. It is the end. I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.